Please be seated. And he will separate people one from another. You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Go away into eternal punishment. Yikes. Those of you who know me know that I don't preach that way. But wow, that is some really harsh language, which is something Jesus uses quite effectively. I tend to lean away from the idea that he is threatening anyone, then or now, and at the same time recognize the impact words like accursed and eternal punishment have on us. But here's the catch. If we were not told the parts about punishment for not doing what is right, would we really pay attention to the parts about blessing for doing what is right? The dark and scary comparisons are often what catch our attention and draw us to the importance of the message, but they are not what we should be focusing on. Beware of letting these words become a distraction from letting Jesus teach us the way. <clears throat> so what do people need? Out of all the needs you might be thinking of right now, how do we prioritize them? Make sense of them when some are dependent on others directly or indirectly? Now, some of you might remember from school or beyond school, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It was first presented in 1943 and has five categories of things we need to survive and live and thrive as humans. The theory is that the needs at each level must be met before we are able to put energy into meeting the needs that are on the next step up. So it starts with the survival needs, like food, water, clothing, the safety needs, then love and belonging, esteem, and then purpose or self-actualization. And that goes up like a pyramid. But if you don't have what's down there on the bottom, it's hard to get what's further up. Simply put, it's hard to do anything like school, work, build skills, take care of family, or take care of health issues if we are chronically hungry, thirsty, cold, or exhausted. Abraham Maslow probably was not channeling the teachings of Jesus Christ when he wrote his paper for the Journal of Psychological Review. But let's compare the list Jesus gives us in Matthew to the hierarchy of needs. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick, prisoner. These are all needs that Jesus expects us to help one another with. And where do you think they fall on the hierarchy of needs? They're all right there on the bottom. Without those things, we can't focus on anything else in life. You might think, oh, sick and prisoner, those don't go with survival, those might go with safety. Well, back then and in a lot of places in the world today, if you were sick and at home, or if you were in prison, you were reliant on other people to come, visit you, and bring you the things that you needed. Like, oh, I don't know, food. So right there on the bottom, those important things that need to happen very first for us to move on and become who we are meant to be, right there on the bottom, right here with the things that Jesus says we are to do for one another.
Jesus is not saying that he expects everyone to do everything, but he is saying that he expects everyone to do something. Our gospel reading today is not about self-congratulations, yay me, or about comparing ourselves to others or judging others on their actions. When it comes down to it, Jesus is giving us some clear instructions for how to live with others and what is expected of each of us. Pay attention. We all need the basics and we all have an impact on one another. Can't you imagine Jesus saying those words? Pay attention. We all need these things and you have an impact on everyone else. He would say it with an awful lot of emotion, huh? He wasn't one to talk monotone to people, I don't think. He wanted you to hear so that you would see, so that you would learn, so that you would act. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. We did those things, but we never saw you. We were looking intently for you, but we never saw you. How did we miss seeing you? Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. not do it to me. You were so busy looking for me. Jesus would tell us that whether we realize it or not, when we, when, when we remember to see one another, we will also see him. And when we remember to serve one another, we will also serve him. Jesus was and is a master of seeing people. And when we follow him, we can learn to see people too. But it goes far beyond giving out a blessing bag with a little food and a clean pair of socks to someone who is experiencing homelessness. Don't get me wrong, those are wonderful things. But is it enough? In seminary, we had many guest lecturers and preachers some of whom I remember, many of whom I do not. One of them shared with us about the Zulu greeting, Sababona, and I'm probably saying it wrong. It means we see you. And in the tradition and culture of the Zulu, it is not the royal we, but the we that acknowledges that each of us are connected to all who have come before us. He talked about what it means to see someone and the importance of doing so because it recognizes the person's humanity, story, and right to exist. To me, Soobona is how Jesus would like us to see one another. It is not my culture or my language, but it resonates with me in my soul. This type of seeing means recognizing the humanity and belovedness of each person. Seeing is acknowledging the struggles and stories of others. And seeing is finding connections between all of us and embracing the similarities and differences as a part of those connections. Now, I did refresh myself on the meaning of Sawabona by watching a great TEDx talk. So if you're interested, you can find it. It's called Sawabona, We See You. And it really talks about how I see you can make a difference in the world. We need to see one another. And when we consider and discuss global events, it's especially important. War, gun violence, famine, natural and man-made disasters, anti-Semitism, immigration, local and global poverty, racism, Israeli, Pakistani, Russian, Ukrainian, Honduran, Mexican, indigenous, 
Chinese, human. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. When we vote, donate to charities, share news stories on social media and have conversations, we are making decisions on who we see and who we want to be seen by others or not see. We are deciding if we are going to see others with the eyes of the compassionate and loving Christ we strive to know or with the eyes of the judgmental, hasty and prejudiced world we know and live in. Will our actions provide the basic necessities to others or deprive them? Will they divide us, preventing us from seeing one another or make connections to see? Will our actions and silences beat others down or will they shout to the world that God is love? Life is good, bad, ugly, beautiful, confusing, exhausting, overwhelming, exhilarating, and maybe even all those things at once. We can get caught up in our own things, the good and the bad. Will that let us, will that prevent us from seeing others? Or will it facilitate the kind of seeing that facilitates and leads to connection, action, and truth? Because we're all dealing with those things. And when we breathe our last and meet Jesus on his throne, we want to have lived in a way that rather than dejectedly asking, how did I miss seeing you? Will we, we will rejoice and proclaim, I saw you. Amen. <laughs>